Well, thanks for having me this morning. Um, I'm, uh, I'm married to my wife, ironically enough. <laughs> you're awake. That's good. That was my test to see whether you're you know, still at you know, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, whatever. That's good. So you're awake. That's good to see. Um, so I'm married to my wife. Her name's Viarda, a uh, good, good Dutch girl uh, who grew up in Colombia, actually, South America. And um, we have five kids together who are going to turn, the oldest is going to turn 10 in a couple weeks, and the youngest is going to turn three in about one week. And so thank you for letting me out of the house. Um, (laughs) It's nice and quiet here. But um, yeah, so I'm I'm from a ministry uh, in Kitchener called Crossways Life. How many people have heard of us before? Great. Uh, So we're a a counseling and discipling ministry and uh, located in Kitchener. and, And it's our joy to help Christians understand the relevancy of Christ. Because I think so often, at least for me growing up, Jesus was great for my my past, forgave my sins, and he secured my future. I'm going to heaven one day, but what about in the now? And and that's really what we we help Christians understand. What about the now? How do we live in life today? And so that's kind of one of the things we want to look at today. But before we begin, I thought this is kind of a funny story to share. There's a during a particularly brutal winter, there was a man and a wife. They decided to escape the, the cold you know, region of Canada and go down to sunny Florida and enjoy some warmth. Uh, so he decided he was going to go ahead because she had some business to take care of, and she was going to join him the next day. So he gets down to Florida, and he, he's having a great time, so he decides to send an email back to his wife, but he mistyped her email address off by one letter. So in sending, instead of sending this email back to his wife, he ends up sending it to an elderly woman, the wife of a pastor, whose hu- the husband, the pastor, just died the day before. Well, the wife, this, this elderly woman, she wakes up, reads the email, and she lets out this piercing scream and falls down and dies. Family comes rushing in, kind of shocked what took place, and they read this email, Dear wife, just got checked in. Everything prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> your loving husband. P.S. Sure is hot down here. <laughs> Imagine reading that one, huh? <laughs> Misunderstandings may be the death of you, <laughs> especially for this poor lady. Jesus tells us that the truth will set us free. The, the corollary of that, then, the opposite is the lies will place us in bondage. And there is a a common deception that I think Christians fall for, and, and if, I, I hope that we can understand it a little bit. And, and deception is more than just a lie. A deception is something that on the surface looks really good, looks appealing, looks to be true, and needs to be kind of unpacked a little bit, and, and hopefully we can understand it. And, and I think people that, that share this deception don't do it with any kind of sense of malice, with any uh, intent to, to hurt people or harm people. I think it's just simply what they were learned, what they were taught. But they unwittingly go on and pass on this deception. And what this deception really is, it's an exaggeration of the gospel. If there can be such a thing as this exaggeration. Let me, let me explain a little bit more what I mean by that. But I think we were told when we were first saved that we come to Jesus just as we are. We pray this prayer of salvation and all our problems are going to go away that suddenly life would be great, life would be wonderful, and all your hurts and all your pains and all your, your insecurities and all those things would immediately disappear, and you'd begin to live this life of abundant joy. You'd always be smiling, always happy, everything would be great, and everything would be a success. And so with an offer like that, we said, well, yeah, why wouldn't I pray that prayer? So we pray that prayer, and something happens. And don't get me wrong, something incredibly happens. In that moment, you were forever changed. You were forever transformed. You became a new person with a new heart, new desires, placed in the Christ Jesus. And for maybe a little bit at least, you experienced a piece of heaven on earth. But then, maybe slowly at first, but eventually you begin to notice some of the cracks in this this facade, this image. And, And some of those old hurts, some of those old pains, some of those old insecurities seem to creep back into your life. And you start wondering, but maybe, maybe something didn't happen right. Maybe I didn't pray the prayer properly. Maybe I'm making a mistake somewhere, and, and, and you know, God's withholding the blessings that He has for me. And, and so I'm wondering, what did I do wrong? To make matters worse, I'm looking around, and I'm seeing all the other people, all the other Christians that have received Christ, and they seem to have it all together. 
because when I ask them how they're doing, they always say they're fine. They don't seem to have any problems. Am I the only one? And so we begin to wonder that maybe, maybe I, it's not working for me. Maybe I'm different. Or maybe, maybe even I'm too screwed up. And so we begin to, to dedicate ourselves. We go to conferences and we read books and we, we go to the church every time it's open and we, we do everything we can and we adopt the motto, fake it till you make it. Right? So when you ask me how I'm doing, what's my answer? Fine. Everything's great. Wonderful. It's not true, but that's what I say. And I, I try to distract myself from this pain and, and, and from what I'm going through. And, and sometimes I hit a conference or I read a book and, or hear a message and, and I just think, wow, this is it. This is why I needed to hear. And, and I seem to be off this high and everything's okay. And then eventually it all comes back. Like the dandelions in my garden, they just keep coming back over and over again. And I get frustrated and I wonder, what am I doing wrong? Why is this not working for me? What do I need to change? And the result of this, I think we live in the disillusionment of an exaggerated gospel. I say it's an exaggeration because Father never said he would instantly remove all the problems. That wasn't what it was about. It wasn't that our problems would magically disappear. Instead, what he promised is to bring healing. But that healing was never meant to be an instant, bam, suddenly everything's good. Instead, that healing was to be one where over time we discover the work that Jesus has done on our behalf, on what he's accomplished. And so this incredible transformation was one to be worked out as we walk with him. As he brings healing to our soul, sometimes bit by bit, but over the rest of our lives, over this journey. And this, this journey that we refer to is, is this term called sanctification. And it's a term that isn't, I don't think, talked about often in, in church, but it, it needs to be because that's where we're at right now. We're in this journey, we're in this process where God is sanctifying our hearts. So our goal today is to understand that a little bit more. So why don't we pray, and, and again, we'll, we'll turn our eyes towards Jesus. Lord, this, this idea of sanctification, this idea of you bringing healing to our hearts, I pray that we would have a, a deep understanding of what that means, that we would be able to walk in the freedom and the wholeness of what you provided for us. And so, Lord Jesus, continue to open our eyes as we trust you this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. I think the story of Lazarus gives us a great picture of this, this thing called sanctification. You know, Lazarus, he had died, and that's, that very much is a picture of what you and I were spiritually before we knew Jesus. When we arrived here on planet Earth, before we knew Christ, we were spiritually dead. We were separated from God. And here was Lazarus, dead, separated from all his loved ones, separated from the world, in this tomb when Jesus shows up. And Jesus cries out in a loud voice, Lazarus! arise, get on out here, right? I mean, if he was on the prices, right, come on down, basically is what he could have said. And out comes Lazarus. But here's what was interesting. Lazarus was in his grave clothes, meaning he was wrapped up kind of like a mummy. Now, growing up for me, I, I have all my mummy un understanding from Scooby-Doo. <laughs> right, remember Scooby-Doo, the mummies on there, right? They'd all be all bandaged up and they'd be walking around like that. I don't think that's kind of how it was for Lazarus. Instead, he would have been all bound up kind of like this. So imagine him walking out. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, twisted in some ways. I'm kind of picturing, how did he walk out? Did he, did he do the penguin waddle? Did he, did he kind of hop? I'm not sure, but he, he comes out, and it's a bit of a struggle. It's not easy for him. And so he comes on out, and here's what Jesus says to him. He says to everyone else around him now, Remove his grave clothes. You see, he's alive inside, is he not? But what's he wrapped up in? He's wrapped up in the death. And I think that's a great picture of you and I. We have been transformed. We've been made alive, but we're still wrapped up in all this death. And so Jesus invites the church now to come alongside of us and help us to remove those grave clothes, to reveal the life inside of us. And that's, a, I think, this beautiful picture of sanctification. But let me illustrate it to you another way. I have a, another illustration on the PowerPoint here, if we can start that. I want you to imagine an apartment. 
You, you know, you just mentioned, Suzanne, that your, your new youth pastor just moved into an apartment. And, you know, one of the first things you need to do in any apartment is you want to begin to decorate the apartment, right? And so we're going to decorate our apartment, but this, this apartment is going to be an allegory for our life. And the decorations are also going to be representative of different aspects of it. So we're not going to put nice paintings and pictures of landscapes and, and so forth up in our, our apartment here. Instead, we're going to put other pictures that are essentially defining moments in our life. Key moments about which we have taken away something to define who we are, who I think you are, who I think God is, the world around me. The, the paradigms or my belief system begin to define are defined here in these pictures. And so I have key memories that I begin to, to place on, these, on this wall. Now, for some of you, you've grown up and you've been highly successful in everything. You were the, you know, the, the most popular person in school, got great grades, athletic, good-looking, lots of friends, very popular, and you almost seem to have the, the golden touch. And so in, if that was you, if you were that 1% of the world, then, you know, your paintings, your pictures would be all about your successes. And that's not bad. The problem is, though, often I find with those people is that they become now the author of their success. It's all about what they were able to accomplish. It's all about what they're able to do. Their, their favorite Bible verse is God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> if you're looking for the reference, it's Second Opinions, Chapter 3, I think. <laughs> so... I think that's the verse. I'm, look it up. Second opinions, yeah. Not first opinions, apparently. But, um, but the idea being is that they're able to pull it off. And so they, they come away with the wrong belief that they're able to do it. And that's not what it is. But I don't think that's the norm. I think the norm is where people grow up and they face difficulties. They face hardships. They face rejection and, and, and abuses and traumas and so forth. And, and those events, they scar our soul. They leave lasting impressions. And so maybe you grow up and, and the first picture we put up here is, is a picture of maybe your parents yelling at you. Maybe they're, they're angry with you because they, they kind of blame you for how their life has turned out. And so maybe you walk away with this belief that says it's all my fault. I bring pain to people. I cause hurt to people. I ruin lives. Or maybe the words that they said in anger become defining moments. I'm a loser. I'm no good. I'm worthless. And so this, this picture now hangs up in our apartment and we stare at it time and time again. Sometimes even we put captions under that picture. I'm a screw up. I'm a failure. I'm no good, I'm unwanted, I'm lazy. Because that's the message I heard over and over again. Either through their actions, through their words, or sometimes even through their inactions. And so this picture stares at me time and time again. And I begin to believe that about myself. Or maybe it's through events that took place where maybe I was bullied at school. Where I was picked on by others. Because of their insecurities, they decided to kind of pick on me so they could feel better about themselves. And so I walk out of that feeling I'm weak and I'm scared and I'm vulnerable and insecure. That I'm an easy target. And then something else happens in my life where, you know, I'm, I'm rejected by the crowd. I don't quite fit in. I don't belong. Maybe I don't wear the right clothes, listen to the right music, act the right way, buy the right kind of things. And I'm a bit of a misfit. I just don't belong to people. Or maybe it's something that I've done, something that I have, uh, um, you know, caused in my own life. Maybe it was something that I, I committed. Maybe I had an abortion or maybe I uh, participated in a crime of some sort. Or maybe someone did something horrendous to me. Maybe I was abused as a child. But something in me that says that I'm now forever dirty. I'm forever shamed. I'm flawed and I'm no good. These are, the, these are the pictures by which, you know, are all through our apartment that we stare at each and every day. And we don't know what to do with them. We don't like them. 
Sometimes we try to rearrange the furniture so they kind of hide the pictures. Other times we just kind of take the picture down hoping to get rid of it. The problem is that picture has been seared into our minds. It's sort of like, you know, if you've had a picture up on a wall for a decade and you take the picture down, you can still see the outline from the sun damage or my house, the dirt. (laughs) And so all that stuff on that wall is still there. Then there's others who try to ignore it and they just kind of wallpaper over it. Picture that in your mind for a moment. You got a picture on a wall, like you got that picture on that wall there, and we put wallpaper right over top of it. That fixes it, doesn't it? Problem solved. There's nothing there. Don't look at it. But it, you can still see there's a picture there. And you don't even need to see the picture. You know what it says. And then there's the really creative people. They say, well, let's just build a new wall. And we'll bury that sucker so we never see it. And we build a wall and we think it's gone, except we keep building walls. And eventually that apartment gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And we feel more and more claustrophobic. And that's what we're staring at here. Well, in any apartment, you also have to have somewhere for your clothes. So we got a nice wardrobe here in our in our apartment, but this wardrobe essentially are the ways by which we learn to cope with life. They're the things that we do to try to make life work for us. And the, the Bible talks about this as being your flesh. And I want you to kind of picture each outfit as being representative of a different way of getting through life. A different method by which we might employ to, to either cover up the hurts or to um, ignore the hurts, or maybe even to try to medicate the hurts so that I feel better about myself. So one outfit we might put on is the power suit. That's the one where I put on my power tie and my best suit when I'm going to go land the deal, go make the, you know, get the job interview. And the idea being is I'm going to be super successful. And if I'm successful, then I'll be loved. Then I'll be wanted. Or maybe I won't need people then. And so we, we try to strive and, and achieve success through what we do. Another outfit's the track suit, where we just think, if I just work hard enough, if I do enough things right, then that would be good. So I got to just, you know, my motto becomes just do it, just make it work. Or another one is the rubber suit. You know, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks to you. And so basically the rubber suit, that person's saying is, I'm not wrong, you are. And they just try to ignore everything that's up on their wall because they can't bear to look at it anymore. For some, then, their closet, they got the chicken suit. That's to run and hide, avoid conflict, avoid problems, make, and hopefully all go away that way. Or you have the Sunday best. Put on your best suit and tie, best dress, and so that maybe at church, and I can perform all this religious activity, maybe then I'll feel better. Or then there's some that put on the invisible suit so no one sees them. Because if no one sees them, they won't get hurt. Or you have the sexy, bla- the sexy black dress where you try to, through relationships and other people's love and affection, begin to fill the emptiness in your soul. For some, it's the fluffy PJs trying to hide and escape from life. Others, it's the bright summer dress where everything's fine, everything's wonderful, and ignore all the problems. Some, they try and put on a super suit, thinking if they can rescue the world, then they'll be okay. For others, it's this suit of armor with a shield included so that no one can hurt me. And in fact, what I'll end up doing is I'll start slugging people with my iron fist and my shield so that I'll hurt them so they don't have a chance to hurt me. The problem is no one loves me either. And I just feel lo- uh, unloved and empty on the inside. For some, they put on the general's costume, the general's outfit. So they got to be in control and in charge, and everyone does it their way. Others, they put on the judge's robe, critical of everyone else. Because if you got problems, then maybe my problems don't look so bad anymore. You see, the, the issue here isn't the kind of outfit you put on. It doesn't matter if it's a moral or immoral outfit. The fact is, these are the things we're doing in our own strength, in our own abilities, independent of Jesus, 
of trying to get life met, trying to find value and worth, and it's never going to be enough. It's never going to work. Well, finally, in our apartment, we got a table. And our table in this apartment here, it, it houses all our trophies. All the things that we've come to, um, to admire and find our value and worth in. And essentially, these trophies are our idols. You see, it's, it's what we look to, it's what we boast about to try and find our worth. Look at my skills. Look at, look at how well I sing. Look at my reputation. Look at my family. Look at my kids. Look at my job. Look at my status in life. Look at my house. Whatever it is that we're relying upon, hoping that other people will uh, accept us, give us their love, and so forth. That's essentially the apartment. That's essentially the, the state of our soul before we meet Jesus. And then one day, maybe in a moment of weakness, some might say, but one day after Jesus has been repeatedly knocking on that door, we finally let him in. Maybe we were afraid to let him in before because how could he ever see this? If he saw the mess of my apartment, the Holy One, how could he ever see that? No, no, I can't let that happen. But one day we do. We let him in. And in that moment, in that one moment, everything's different. You're placed into Christ, united with Him, crucified, buried, raised up, new creation, holy and righteous, new heart, new desires, perfect and complete. But still living in the same apartment. Still living surrounded by the same mess. And what we do next becomes a critical, important step. What I've seen, the mistake that I think we've made is we've misunderstood what, what does come next, what Jesus wants to do. See, the Reformation taught us by Martin Luther, the Reformation taught us that we are saved, we are justified, made righteous by what? By grace through faith. I mean, God did it all, right? It wasn't my hard work. It wasn't my sweat. It wasn't my tears. I could come to Jesus just as I am. Didn't matter. And he would what? Love and accept me. Amen? But then it was almost like a bait and switch. You could come to Jesus just as you are, but now that you're saved, <laughs> now, now, now you're not okay. Now you've got to clean this up over here. And now that's not acceptable. And that's not right. And you've got to start doing this. You've got to stop doing that. And all of a sudden, I'm not all right anymore. And so I... I go on now this journey where I'm sanctified, I might be saved by grace, but I'm sanctified by my works. And that's not what it's about. We need to understand that not only are you saved and justified by grace through faith, meaning God does it all, you and I are also sanctified by grace through faith, meaning God does it all. Let me share a verse with you. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23 and 24, Paul here writes, he says, May God himself, are you God? No. Sometimes we think we're God, but we're not, right? May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you, who's that? God. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. It's his job. It's up to him to sanctify our souls, to clean up the mess. It's not something that we're trying to do in our own strength. It's rather what he's wanting to do in us. And this, this error, this deception of sanctified by our works, goes all the way back to the first century church. We read the, the letter to the Galatians, and this is the exact error that the churches of Galatia fell into. That they thought they were saved by grace, that Jesus was enough for that, but now it's up to them to follow all the rules. Make sure they're doing all the right things. And make no mistake, these were dedicated people. These men were willing to get circumcised. That's dedication. <laughs> right? You know, like the the the... The pig and the chicken, when they talk about breakfast, one's a sacrifice, one's dedication, right? Or commitment. 
Well, these, you know, these guys in Galatia, they were serious about God. But they were going about it the wrong way. So Paul wrote this. He says, you foolish Galatians. You foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to know from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? How are you saved? Were you saved by your efforts? Were you saved by your works? No, we are saved by grace through faith. Well, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, having been saved by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by your flesh, by your own efforts, by your works, what you do? It just doesn't work that way. I love how the Message Bible says it. He says, if you weren't smart enough and strong enough to get saved in the first place, what makes you think you can improve on it? It can't be done. It can't be done. So what does sanctification look like? Well, like I said, in that moment when we open the door and we let Jesus into our hearts, in that moment you are forever changed, placed into Christ, forgiven, made pl- clean, pure, holy, righteous, new creation, but living in the same apartment. And this is when the sanctification begins. This is when the healing begins. Because what Jesus says is he, he comes up to a picture. And he points at this picture and he says, you know, this, this is a pretty painful moment in your life. This is a really defining moment in your life. And it has led to a lot of choices, poor choices on your behalf, where you've been trying to fix it, disprove it, cover it up. Or deal with it. But it's only led to more hurt and more pain. But I want you to know that person, that person that that guy's talking about, that person doesn't exist anymore. That person was crucified with Christ and no longer lives. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. And now the truth is that person is gone. And so with your permission, Jesus says, and that's kind of important, I think, to him, because he's not forcing himself on us. He says, when you're ready, we can take this picture down and put up a new one. A new one that defines who you really are. That you're loved and you're accepted. And you really are perfect just the way you are. Do you realize that? That if you don't do anything better in your life, you're still perfect. If you never perform another act of, of spiritual things or religion or any other, any other godly thing, you're still perfect in love. Because that's grace. That's grace. It's, it's too big for us. People say, but hold on, we still need to do something. Well, yes and no. It's not that we need to do something. We now get to do something. That's what the grace of God does. You've been set free. Not free to have to do things, but free to get to do things now. And so the grace of God has appeared and He's changed us. And so now we got a picture up on that wall that begins to define who I am. Now sadly, from time to time, I go back to that old picture and God says, remember, it's not who you are. That person died. This is who you are now. But you see, not all memories are like that. You see, we've had events that took place to us that you can't simply forget, nor does God want you to. I mean, how do you forget when you've been sexually abused? How do you forget when you have been uh, humiliated and shamed and, and, and torn down when you've been hurt? You don't forget those things, nor should you forget those things. But what Jesus does is he comes to those memories, those those moments, and he begins to redefine them for us. You see, up to now, all we've had is the enemy's interpretation of that event in us. That it was my fault. That I was weak. That that event had everything to do with me and what it said about me. And all of a sudden, we begin to look at them a little bit differently. We discover that it wasn't a declaration of me and my value that someone hurt me. It had more, said more about them than it said about me. 
And I begin to look at those memories and suddenly the memories look different. Because I begin to discover that Jesus was there. And suddenly that memory doesn't have the same twinge of pain and hurt. Instead now there's hope because I realize it's not my fault. That I am safe. That I'm okay. And then other pictures begin to change and I, I begin to define who I am now. I'm, I'm a child of God. I'm the one whom Jesus loved. How do you hurt a person like that? How can you, how, what can you do to hurt a person that is loved by the, by the God of the universe? It's hard to bring damage to that person's heart. And then even those things that we've done and we think that I can never be forgiven for, Jesus shows us His hands and reminds us the price He paid and that you and I have been forgiven that all of our sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. That he'll remember your sins when? No more. It doesn't say on judgment day, by the way. Right? It says, I'll remember your sins no more. Do you realize that? That you are forever clean and forever pure. And you might think, well, you don't know what I've done. You don't know who I did it with. You don't know how many times I've done it and, and when I'm going to do it again next. That's true, I don't. But he does. And it doesn't matter how many times you've done it, what you did, who you did it with, and when you'll do it again, he says, I forgive you. Because when did he forgive us? 2,000 years ago. Do you realize that? He doesn't forgive you when you come knocking on his door asking for forgiveness, he says, it is finished. I have forgiven you. You're already clean and pure. Even on your worst day and your worst moment, all of this is true of you. Talk about a home makeover. Well, now he comes to my closet and he kind of opens it up and goes, ugh. <laughs> This is, this is not you. I mean, this, this, I mean, it doesn't belong to you. I mean, you can wear the chicken suit if you really want to. You can wear the suit of armor. You're free to. But why would you? You see, I bought you a whole new wardrobe. It's essentially the fruit of the Spirit. It's my life in you, he says. Where my grace now, God says, provides you the sufficiency to live. My grace in you, he says, provides you the power now to love one another, to accept one another, to be kind and gracious and tender-hearted and forgiving to one another. You see, one of the greatest secrets I've discovered, about, and uh, secret's not the best word, one of the greatest aspects of the Christian life that I've discovered is that God isn't asking me to live the Christian life. See, I can't do it. Can I live your life? Think about it. Can I live your life for a moment? No, why not? Because I'm not you, right? Could you live like an angel? You know, angels, they, they, they you know, wield flaming swords. They travel back and forth between heaven and earth, perfect messengers of God. They battle with demons. Could anyone live like an angel for one year? For one month? Can anyone do it for five seconds? I mean, one of the cool things about angels is they literally light up the room when they walk in. They're their own light bulbs, right? Think about the money you'd save on electricity. Could anyone do it for five seconds, just light up the room? It's kind of a silly request, isn't it, for me to ask you to live like an angel? Why is it silly? It's impossible because you're not angels, right? Well, who is Jesus? He's God, is he not? If you and I can't live like an angel, what makes you think we can live like God? We can't. But here's the good news. 
He's not asking us to. Instead, what he's asking is to allow him to live his life through us. That's what the Christian life is. It's not difficult for us to live. It's impossible for us to live because you're not Jesus. But he is not out there. He's now in here wanting to express his life through us. And these outfits are essentially his character. It's his life we're putting on. And we begin to now express his life wherever we go. Well, that brings us now to our, our idols. All the places that we've gone to to get our needs met. The relationships and, and reputations and finances and so forth. And sometimes what God needs to do is he needs to take some of these away. And that's hard to let go. To realize that that something needs to leave because I've been holding on to those things and, de- and depending upon those things. Whereas other things, he says, we can keep, but let's, let's put it in a less prominent place. Because it's not really what matters. Instead, let's put on this, this table what really does matter, which is really important. And we begin to discover that you know, what matters to God matters to us now. And suddenly the command he gives to love him and love others as we love ourselves isn't so difficult because it's what we want to do. It's our desire. And that's what we begin to place there. And so we have a whole new outlook on life. Everything begins to look different and change. And, and I want you to know, to know that this process is not a quick one. It doesn't happen overnight. See, the great mistake you might hear, hear from me is thinking that I'm, I'm saying something passivity, that this is all that God does, that we're just going to wake up one day and the apartment's going to be tidied and clean, and, and that's not it. He doesn't work that way, not often. Sometimes, and, and in small doses for sure, but often what he does is he says, let's do this together. Because in doing this together, we get to have intimacy together. We get to build the relationship. Because as incredible as all this is, the healing, the new pictures, the new outlook on myself and others, that's secondary to knowing and walking with Him. That's secondary to the joy of that deep, intimate relationship that I have with Him as I walk with Him. And so that's being played out in this sanctification journey. And so what he'll do is he'll comfort us. He'll be patient with us. He'll understand when we put the old picture back up and we take down the new picture. And he says, you don't have to do that, you know. When you're ready, we can keep going. And bit by bit, step by step, we'll 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 redecorate this house and you'll see life in a whole new way. And so Jesus invites us to be a part of this journey And what I hope to do tonight and tomorrow is to explain a little bit more of what we talked about here in a bit more detail of what God's done and what He's doing and how we can respond to that. But let me leave you with one of the best kept secrets in the church. Every one of us is still a work in progress. Nobody, and I mean nobody, has it all together. It doesn't matter how long you've walked with Jesus, how well you've walked with Jesus, you have not yet arrived. God's still working in us. He still wanted to go deeper. He still wanted to bring deeper healing, deeper wholeness. You know, that's what the word sanctification or salvation literally means. The Greek word is sozo. It means to be made whole. I like that because that's what I need. I need to be made whole. The only The only requisite, the only thing that God requires of you and I is this, humility. The willingness to receive from Him what He's wanting to do. The openness to that, the fact I don't have it all together and that He wants to bring hope and change. Let's pray. Father, We celebrate this incredible work of salvation, but recognize it was just the introduction. It's just the beginning. 
Do you now want to walk with us on this incredible journey of sanctification, of healing, of being made whole, of coming to discover what you have already done in our hearts? Where we're shedding all the lies and all the false beliefs and, and, and deceptions that we've, we've fallen for so we could walk in the freedom and the power and the truth of who you are in us and who we are in you. So Jesus, I pray that today and tomorrow that we have a deeper understanding of how we could respond to what you're presently doing in our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen.